Hello everybody, this is Lori Anderson, contributor with FreedomOutpost.com and co-host for Resurrect the Republic Dirty Uncle Sam Radio. Remember, the American Patriot does not follow the path of least resistance, but resists because it is right. In the face of fear, oppression, and tyranny they stand. Their soul binds them to a duty that cannot be bought nor sold. They stand and speak for the voiceless, weak, and oppressed, just as Jesus did. What we're going to be discussing today is the Rebecca Barrington versus the State of Nevada case and why it is so important to each and every individual that lives in the State of Nevada, including law enforcement officers. The code in which we are going to be discussing is 202.90.2. However, let's start with the entire code. Aiming firearm at a human being. Discharging weapon where a person might be endangered. Penalty. Unless a greater penalty is provided in the NRS 202.287. A person who willfully, number one, aims any gun, pistol, revolver, or other firearm, whether loaded or not, at or toward any human being. Or discharges any firearm, air gun, or other weapon, or throws any deadly missile in a public place or in any place where any person might be endangered thereby, although an injury does not result. Why is this an important statute and why is it important for you to understand as well as understand why your right to bear arms, your right to self-defense, and your right to protect your property are in danger by this code. This code, although when you read through it, you would think that the only way somebody could be charged with this code is if they actually fired a weapon at a person, that is not the case. If you willfully fire your firearm in any place, and that includes your own private property, where any person, which includes you, if you are firing the weapon, might, not are, but might, be endangered thereby, even though no injury results, you are and will be found guilty of a gross misdemeanor if you are charged under this code. And I'm going to prove that to you. In the case of Rebecca Barrington versus the state, this case was about her private property. It was about her chickens who were in a pen being run by a neighbor's dog who failed to keep his dog on his own property. When Rebecca saw that the dog was running her chickens, she tried to shoo the dog away. The dog did not shoo but started growling at her. Rebecca being former animal control, went and got her small pistol, and then shot one shot into the sand near the dog to try to get the dog to leave her property. Now this case, of course, goes into much more than that, which when I have Miss Rebecca Barrington on in an interview, you will hear all the dirty, twisted details in which they used in order to convict her of this gross misdemeanor. However, Ms. Barrington has brought this to the Nevada Supreme Court, not so much because of herself, but because she realizes that this code is not only unconstitutional, it is a violation of her rights, your rights, your ability to protect your own property, and you can be charged with this code by simply firing your own weapon even if you are the only one around. Prosecution in this case tried to claim that there was an individual within 10 feet in which in their own court paperwork proves that that is not possible because in their own court paperwork they state that the gentleman was not on her private property. Thus, I will show you via Google Maps 
and measurements that that is not humanly possible. So even while in the lower court, she is also going after them for prosecutorial misconduct, you also have an individual who's representing the state in front of three Supreme Court justices for the state of Nevada lying to those justices. So the first thing I want you to understand and I want you to see, this is the area in which Miss Barrington lives. You can clearly see that this area is not a highly populated area. This is an area in the middle of nowhere. As you will see, I'm scrolling down just to show you satellite imagery of your nearest neighbors. So let's go to measurements. The reason I want to go to measurements is to show you there's no human possible way that these individuals were that close and the prosecutor absolutely had to have lied to the Supreme Court justices. Right here is Mrs. Barrington's property. This is her home. This is her property. As you can see, these are her closest neighbors here. What I have done is right here I have checked. This is 10.93 feet. So the individual would have had to have been on her property. To the best of my knowledge, this right here is where she fired the shot. When we go over with an interview with her, we will get more clarification. But to the best of my knowledge, from what I understand, this first top dot is where she fired the shot. So I'm going to drag this to the closest possible ranges of someone not being on her property could be. Straight to the street, you're looking at 93 feet. If you go to the edge of this other property, shortest distance would be 208.96 feet and to go to the shortest distance on this property would be 136.92 feet. I am unsure as to which neighbor, if it was this neighbor, this neighbor, or this neighbor that the prosecutor was claiming was within 10 feet, but this neighbor is also when you go to the edge of their driveway, is 137.93 feet. So there is absolutely no way that the individual was within 10 feet. There's been a lot of prosecutorial misconduct. One of the neighbors that was supposedly a witness against her was also previously um, dealt with Miss Barrington, and she had video proof that he was an unreliable witness because. He had previously, on many different occasions, had altercations with Miss Barrington. I do know that there was a restraining order at one point in time, and I don't know if it was on that individual or a different one. However, I do know that there are restraining orders that were involved, and the witnesses that were used against him, that was straight hearsay, was uh, used against her. To put on another note on this Supreme Court case, on the, prosecu on the prosecution, they tried to um, justify the police officer not gathering evidence. And the only thing that they could come up with that he tried to gather was her weapon. Well, why would he try to gather her weapon? That's not evidence of anything except for that the gun was shot. That would not show how many bullets were fired. And all that would show is that the weapon had been shot, which Miss Barrington admitted that she had fired one shot into the sand. Thus, gathering her weapon was simply a means to be able to hold on to their weapon. They did not retrieve her weapon because they did not have a warrant, and Miss Barrington refused. Good for her. Because that would have proved nothing. However, when Miss Barrington tried to show the police officer where she fired the shot, he did not try to gather any shell or shells. He did not take photos at the scene. 
and he did not measure any distances. The prosecution alleges only everything out of hearsay using witnesses that are known to be against Miss Barrington. She has taken this fight to the Supreme Court of Nevada because of this unconstitutional, unethical code. This code can not only affect every individual within the state of Nevada, it can also affect law enforcement officers. So I hope and have the hope that law enforcement officers will also stand behind the nullification of this code via the Supreme Court. Why do I say that? Because when you are in the line of duty and you willfully fire your weapon, whether it is on private property, whether it is on state property or public property, it does not matter. You have willfully fired your weapon and someone might have been in danger. You yourselves can also be charged with this code. In order to see the case, you can go to the Nevada Supreme Court and you can look up this case search in the Appellate Case, case Management System under 68517. Ms. Barrington needs our support and we need to get this information out to the people for all of the individuals in the state of Nevada. I'm going to play a short clip of the Supreme Court case, of which I'm going to leave a link below for the full Supreme Court hearing on this case for you to be able to listen to in the description box below. Ironically, this individual right here, who is the prosecution, is who is representing the state of Nevada, makes the comment in this Supreme Court case that it is not the duty of an officer to collect evidence. Isn't that amazing? It is not the duty of the officer to collect evidence at an alleged crime scene. And the only evidence he can quote that the officer tried to get without a warrant was her weapon. And why in the world would they want to do that other than to take her weapon. As they know it had been fired, she told them she had fired the weapon one time. They wouldn't even have to do ballistics on it. Later on, Miss Barrington turned her weapon in via the unlawful order of the court. She did so voluntarily after ordered by the court. And yet, she even jumped through hoops and went through another gun control firearms safety course under the promise of the judge that she would have her gun returned to her and they still have her weapon. So she sits defenseless because they just wanted to hold her weapon. I see this as a means of them being able to try to confiscate weapons and no other reason whatsoever. Make no mistake, this can and eventually will come back on law enforcement officers as well via prosecutors that want to go after certain law enforcement officers. You can be charged with this as a crime, a gross misdemeanor as well, and your weapons can be taken. We must all stand up for what is right Show our support for Ms. Barrington. Thank her for standing up. A person who is a very quiet individual, no criminal history, good neighbor, and loves people, finds herself in the mess of fighting for us all. That I will leave you with the closing arguments of Ms. Barrington's attorney. <clears throat> Good morning, Justices. Uh, if it please the Court, may I begin? All right. Um, opposing counsel's first argument to you was that simply because a statute is old, it must therefore be constitutional. Clearly such a position is not true. I imagine a number of the cases and statutes that began in 1911 are no longer valid law today. Now, the word might is constitutionally unconscionable. Simply put, if I told my wife that I might show up at her birthday party, she would ask for more clarification. 
This statute does not ask for more clarification. All it asks is if it might endanger a human being. Any gun might misfire. Any gun might uh, ricochet. Any discharge of any firearm can endanger a human being, which means that the word might effectively reads out the second half of the statute. So Justice Douglas, back to your initial question as to whether the question if it endangers a human being is left to the jury. It's not under the terms of the statute. Any discharge might endanger a human being. So the jury is left only to determine whether the gun was fired willfully. Which leads me to my next comment on sufficiency of the evidence. The only evidence of the second gunshot were that individuals Madden and Harris heard the gunshot fired and witnessed her running. There is no evidence produced by the state that the gunshots were willful. And as recently as three months ago in Barber v. State, it was recognized by this court that the failure of the state to prove a necessary element is insufficient evidence to convict. Therefore, the second bullet shot, if any, had insufficient evidence to convict a trial. Now, regarding the first bullet shot, the only witness to that shot was my client herself, Ms. Barrington, who testified that she shot it into soft sand no more than 20 feet away at a shallow angle, which was confirmed by the detective in this case to not be a dangerous shot. So the first shot was also confirmed not to endanger a human being, even though it was willful. So there is clearly insufficient evidence to convict my client in this matter. Moving on, um, the duty to collect evidence was discussed by opposing counsel. He said and noted that there is no duty to collect all potential evidence, but assuredly there is a duty to collect some potential evidence. Taking a single witness statement for a shots, plural, fired when she admitted to firing only one shot is not enough evidence collected to convict her on more than one shot, which is what he was called there for. Counsel, in that, as you point that issue out, did the police not attempt to retrieve the, the weapon? They tried to retrieve the weapon, and of course my client, being a firm believer in her constitutional rights, stated that they did not have a warrant and could not seize her property without such. Now, are we supposed to take her invocation of a constitutional right as an admission of guilt? I don't think so. But doesn't that go to the police making an attempt to procure? If he really desired to could take into consideration. May I answer your question, Your Honor? Go ahead. Okay. If he really wanted to acquire the weapon and see how many shots were fired and do his due diligence, he should have thence acquired a warrant, which was fully able to do. I'm sure a judge would have given him a warrant for a shots, plural, fired when she admitted to a single shot, if, of course, the state contends that there's sufficient evidence to convict. All right. If Thank you have you a justice. closing thought, give us your closing thought. I'm sorry, sir? If you have a closing thought, please give us your closing thought. Oh, um, no more than I would just like to rephrase what I said earlier, that the word might in a criminal statute is unconstitutionally, or um, unconscionably unconstitutional. Thank you, Justices. Thank you. So I would like to state and reiterate one more time. The only thing they tried to gather was the weapon. The weapon would prove nothing. It would not prove how many shots were fired, it would have only simply proven that the gun had been fired. So it did not matter if they had gotten the gun or did not obtain the weapon. All it would simply show is that the weapon had been fired. Anyone who has studied ballistics or crime scene investigation knows this. They did not collect the shell or shells. They claim there were two shots fired. Ms. Barrington states there was only one shot fired. As you can see, this is a case that should be very concerning to every individual in the state of Nevada, and that is including law enforcement officials. I would ask that you please share this video, share this information, support Ms. Barrington in her fight to stand for your individual rights in the state of Nevada. No one should be able to be charged under this code. Thank you, Ms. Barrington, for standing for each and every one of us. I will be posting in approximately one week to two weeks an interview with Ms. Barrington about this situation so that you can get the entire story 
of how prosecutorial misconduct, including from the judge's bench, to law enforcement, to the prosecutor's office, and the things that were allowed to be done, including the egregious situations about them still holding her firearm. They wanted to force her into a community control situation and having to an answer to quote unquote probation officers. This lady, a law abiding citizen, is being attacked. This lady has taken it upon herself to challenge this law, and we must stand behind her, beside her, and speak out for her. Help share this information. Thank you. God bless you. And have a great night.